Hello, lovely writers. I am Renee Tulipe with the Lyrical Language Lab, and this is another episode of Peak and Critique. Be right back. Hey, you're still there. Great. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do so using that conveniently located subscribe button right there in the corner, and all you have to do is touch it. It really helps me out a lot. And also stick around to the very end of the video where we'll have a writing prompt. All right, so today I have two prose picture book samples, both of which use a second language. And that is one of my favorite things. Back in the day, I wanted to be an interpreter. I studied languages. I love languages. Now I'm in Italy, so obviously I speak another language. So I always really like it when I see a, a word in another language pop up in an English language book. So let's get to this first sample. All right, this is called If Your Babysitter is a Bruja, and it is by Ana Siquera. So let's give it a quick read. If it's Halloween and you have a new babysitter, be careful. She might be a witch. Be wary and watch for signs. If she wears a black sombrero, whoosh on a broomstick and whoop like a crow. Run, corre! She's definitely a bruja, a witch. But don't duck, drop, and roll. Witches have big noses for a reason. She'll sniff you out in a flash and shove her fire-breathing dragons at you. Ay, caramba! When you drub los dragones, she'll serve you ogre's fingers, dedos de ogros. Don't say no or... And Anna leaves us hanging there. Oh, well, I guess we're just going to have to buy the book when it gets published. So let's go back and see what's going on here. First of all, obviously, it's Spanish. I love saying all the words. Even if my pronunciation is horrible, I don't care. I just have such a good time saying, trying to pronounce things in other languages. Um, so we're at Halloween. All right, so there's a lot of possibilities here. First of all, we've got a holiday, a possible holiday book. And right off the bat, though, I would ask Anna, does it need to be Halloween? Because while it can be a nice hook to have a holiday theme for your book, it might also make it more, you know, an, a year-round book if you could do it without Halloween. But, you know, either way, you're probably in a good zone, you know, just something to think about. Do I want that holiday hook or do I want this to be something that's not just connected to a holiday? Uh, but that's just, you know, besides the whole lyrical language thing. So let's look at what's happening here language wise. So you have a new babysitter. Be careful. She might be a witch. Now, right off the bat, the title of this is if your babysitter is a bruja. So why not already have that word here, right? Because the illustrations are going to show us what the bruja is. And I have had the question before, is it okay to use foreign language words in my English language picture book? I always say, yeah, why not? I mean, look at the success of Skippy John Jones. I think the trick is really finding the balance between how many words can you use. And I like to push it, honestly. I also have a, a picture book on submission that uses French terms. And I like to push it because I think the illustrations are going to show us what those words mean. And of course, you can always add a little glossary in the back of the book, which is a nice little addition that teachers will like. So why not just go for it, especially in your early drafts? You can always pull them back later, right? If an editor or your agent or your critique partners think it's going too far and we no longer have a book in English in Italian or French or, or Spanish. Um, but I'm all for experimentation and, and just throwing everything in there and then seeing what should stick. So right now for this first thing of this first sentence, I would use the Bruja since that is your title. And we're going to know from the cover most likely and certainly from the illustration that this is a witch. And then you can decide later, do I need to also put in a witch? Uh, as in below, you, uh, you immediately give both languages, ogre's fingers, dedos de ogros. So we know what those are. I don't think that's necessary for every single instance of Spanish, but consider, you know, 
when that is necessary and when it's not. So right off the bat here, I don't think it would be necessary. I think you could just say bruja. Be wary and watch for signs. I do like that you're using this alliteration with the witch wary watch and you know the ch sounds, but again, I kind of already want you to get in there with that Spanish language. Then we have if she wears a black sombrero. Oh, and side note, when I do use foreign terms in my books, I just put them in italics and just let them lie there. So at least we give a clue to the reader that there's something different about this word. So if she wears a black sombrero, whoosh on a broomstick. Here I got a little stuck because I think there's something missing. I think it's just grammar. Uh, wears a black sombrero. We're in the present. We've got to say whooshes on a broomstick and whoops like a crow. All those things have to match. All the verbs have to match the tense. So whooshes on a broomstick. Comes in a bike so fast like flying. Uh, art notes, also these, I just italicize and I make them as succinct as humanly possible. So whooshes in on a broomstick. Just, you know. So she's on, oh, on a bike. You know, it's enough to say on a bike, right? Let the illustrator decide what's happening. It, whooshing already gives the clue to your illustrator, so we don't need to take the reader out of the story. Remember, your, your first readers are going to be agents or editors. We don't want to get them all tangled up in long art notes. So just on a bike. That's good. Um, that's plenty. And whoops like a crow. Run, corre. Do you even need run? Do you need it? I don't think so. Corre. We're going to see in the illustrations that this child is running away. Or I would put the Spanish first. Corre. Run. She's definitely a bruja. I don't think you even need a witch. We figured it out by now, right? So. But don't duck, drop, and roll. Hide under bed. It's enough. Uh, the whole art note thing, by the way, I'm going to put a link in the description here. Tara Lazar has a wonderful post about art notes and how she uses them. And I adopted the way that she does it. And I love it. It's just, they're just really succinct. They don't take you out of the story if you're just trying to read through it. It gives you a really fast idea of what the image is without having to say art colon under bed. Um, just, they're just really quick things that give a sense of what's happening without overdoing it. Um, again, I'll link to that in the description below. Definitely worth a look-see. So, but don't drop, don't duck, drop, and roll. Witches have big noses for a reason. I'd love to have the word here, the word for nose. Uh, I don't even know what it is in Spanish. Naso in Italian. Witches have big nazi for a reason. That's just fun, right? So why not? Take it, take it farther and, and see what happens. Again, decide later what you don't want in there. She'll sniff you out in a flash and shove her fire-breathing dragons at you. And here is, since dragons in Spanish is so close to the English, dragones, why not just use dragones here as well? Her fire-breathing dragonis at you. It's just fun to say. Uh, stuffed animals pillow fight. That's cute. That's pretty, that's fairly succinct. So I would just leave that. Ay, caramba. So that's fun. All right, next section. When you drub los dragones, she'll serve you ogre's fingers. Now, I have to admit, I did not even know the word drub. Sorry, I had to go look it up and then I laughed because it just means to hit or beat someone repeatedly. So I'm picturing this kid wailing on this dragon. But I don't know if drub, I mean, is that a word that people use? I'm pretty happy with my vocabulary, but I don't even know this word, which is kind of uh, disconcerting. So anyways, when you drub los dragones, it's funny for the alliteration and, you know, why not? Throw it in there, they'll figure it out. Um, you know, but maybe look at some alternatives as well. Just because I don't know, it doesn't mean everybody else doesn't. And she'll serve you ogre's fingers, dedos de ogros. Again, I'll put this, I'd put the Spanish first, as long as you're going there, 
right? It's called if your babysitter is a bruja and she serves you dedos de ogros. And I love that because also that is close to the English. So you can kind of figure it out even if you don't put the English in there. But yeah, in this case, maybe it's a little more advanced. You could probably, you know, dedos and fingers are completely different. So you might want to put that in. But again, put the English after. That's my two cents. You know, see what other folks say in your critique group. Um, again, good art note here. Baby sausage, nice and short and sweet. I'm wondering if you already read Tara Lazar's uh, article on that <laughs> because you, you, you pretty much have it. That's pretty much what she does. Uh, don't say no or, and then we don't know what happens. Um, as far as the progression of this, again, just very quickly, the use of the foreign language, I love it. Go a little bit further, put the Spanish first, and yeah, don't be afraid of it. That's what I, that would be, be my first advice on that. You can always pull back later. As far as progression, I think this is a good start. It's involving the reader immediately because it's speaking directly to the reader. And so this direct address, you know, pulls me in right away. And I also, I like the premise of if it's Halloween, and you have a new babysitter because already we, we've got the situation, we've got the who, we've got the where, we've got the when, uh, and we've got you know something to look out for. So I think you could have more fun maybe with the page turns. She might be a witch. Be wary and watch for signs. <whistles> or if she dot 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 <whistles> wears a black sombrero. Think about where your page turns are here. Could each one of these things be a new? page because the images are really strong right where's a black sombrero we have that and i think an illustrator could have fun with this by making it maybe not so obvious if that you know if she's a witch or not that with the hat wishes on a broomstick and whoops like a crow by whoops are you meaning like wishing like this whooping or actually the sound of the crow that i'm not clear about that so you might want to take a look at this word and see if that is um the exact right word because i don't know if you mean movement or sound with this word and then we've got the running she's definitely a witch so you know you've taken us through these signs um and then we go into, but you can't do this because she's going to find you anyways. So I'm just wondering if, you know, I've only seen this little part of it, if the progression is going to be enough, if there's enough of a build in here. I can't tell from this. I will say, though, that I am engaged and I would keep reading at this point. Um, again, I don't know where it goes from here. And so be aware of you know what's happening you know with your dynamics throughout this is it does it have a crescendo is it building to some sort of a point is there some sort of an obstacle to overcome is it like skippy john jones where there's it's really just a big adventure uh what kind of trouble are they getting into i mean but up until this point anna i think it's engaging i think it's fun i love the spanish and the way that you're using it here i think your language is fine for this you're you're clearly working on using alliteration and strong verbs and they are very strong in here sniffing you out and your imagery is very strong as well so i think you're on a good path here just be aware of again the dynamics and see where it takes you but for now good job and thank you so much for submitting this it was a lot of fun all right, so let's move on to our second sample, which also uses Spanish. And this one was sent in by Cynthia Harmony. And what a beautiful name. And Arte es Vida is the title. So also the title is in Spanish. And let's give it a read. Vida lived in a one shape, one shade of gray kind of town. When the Pueblo's leaders forbade them to shine, Abuela Tita journeyed far away to become an artista. On her return, she found gloom rooted deep into the barren landscape. If only their pueblo could find color again, some way, somehow, some day. Tita's hands and memory withered, yet her beloved stories remained. Every night, Tita shared flower-colored tales with Vida. And with every story, Vida's heart and imagination leaped with possibilities. 
Together they traveled far and wide, high and low, over land, across seas, and through deep blue skies. They ventured on vast safaris. And once again, Cynthia also leaves us hanging here because I really want to keep reading. I want to know what's going to happen on these vast safaris. I want to know where they're going. I think this is really beautiful, really beautiful, very lyrical. Whereas our first sample is a rollicking, fun story. This one is a quieter, more lyrical sample. Um, again, also using Spanish, but in a more subdued way in a more, I would say, organic way that just the words are there without explanation and there aren't too many of them. And in this case, I think Cynthia's already found a really beautiful balance of when to use them and when not to use them. And I love that the, the title is in Spanish and I also love the play on words for vida. Uh, I'm going to assume in Spanish, uh, vida also means life because in Italian, vita is life and it's also her name. So, arte es vida, art is life, and art is vida, the character, the granddaughter here. And uh, yeah, I really love that play. So, vida lived in a one shape, one shade of gray kind of town. What a wonderful opening image that is. It's so strong. The one shape is interesting to me because I'm, what does that mean exactly? All the houses are the same shape. Uh, the one shade of gray, of course, they're all the same color. When the Pueblo's leaders forbade them to shine. So right at the beginning, you give us a history, a problem, a historical problem in this town. But I'm wondering if this needs to be fleshed out just a tiny bit, just a teeny tiny bit, because it says forbade them to shine. And I don't know who them is at this point. Obviously, it's the, it may just be a matter of changing them to the people or to the town uh, to be very specific. Who, the, who is them? What is them? Who or what is them? Uh, that could probably be the only thing that you need to flesh that out a bit more. I, I need to understand better what that is. I don't need to know why did they forbid it. I might find out later on in the story, but the fact that they did that, that the, the leaders forbid the people or the town to shine, uh, to, which I'm going to assume me, use color or imbue the, the place with joy. Um, it's a bit of a mystery to me and I like that there's this bit of mystery without being over explained. You know, I don't need the backstory at this point. So I love the second line, this immediate intrigue that happens there. Abuela Tita journeyed far away. That should be two words. Just do that. Far away to become an artista. So the town and the townspeople are forbidden to shine, but that doesn't mean that this is something that's happened in the whole land. This is what I'm getting from, from your first three lines. So I already understand that it's only in this town and that people are still free to travel to other places to find this color and this joy uh, that is lacking in this one shade of gray town. So she goes off to become an artist. And I love the history here because we're talking about Abuela Tita. So that's a lot of stuff in just three lines. We have some backstory and we have the present situation. And we have two characters. So a lot happening there. So the next part says, on her return, she found gloom rooted deep into the barren landscape. Oh, just a tiny thing, I would say in, in the landscape, not into the landscape. If only their Pueblo could find color again, some way, somehow, someday. Here I get a little bit confused. Um, Vida is currently, the, the granddaughter, living in this one shade of gray town. Abuela journeyed far away. So what's missing for me here is the time frame. I'm not understanding exactly. And then she came back. So did all of this happen when Vida was already born? Or does this happen when Abuela was younger? Like how long has this town been this way? What, how old was Abuela when she left to become an artist and then when she came back? I do think there's a little bit of information missing for me to make sense of the progression here. And because she came back, she found gloom rooted deep. In the beginning, I thought that Vida was alive during all of this, but now I'm thinking, no, 
because then she tells um, Vita Vita the stories. So I'm like, oh, well, maybe maybe this is something that Abuela Tita did when she was younger. So it's not clear. The time frame isn't clear. Let's just leave it at that. She found gloom rooted deep in the barren landscape. If only their pueblo could find color again. Some way, somehow, someday. I like this very simple wish and this repetition of the sum, sum, sum uh, works very nicely. Tita's hands and memory withered. Gorgeous. Love that. Hands and memory withered. I mean, what an image. It's just beautiful. So I'm seeing the passage of time here, even though I had that little blip, a little time warp before. Now I'm understanding that, okay, Vida is here. She's watching her abuela getting older, yet her beloved stories remained. Every night, Tita shared flower-colored tales with Vida. Again, just one beautiful image after the next. And again, we have the passage of time here. With every story, Vita's heart and imagine leaped with possibilities. So we have Abuela passing on her love of art and color uh, to her granddaughter. And through the stories, they are traveling far and wide. I also like what you've done with the language here and how you've used the space and how you've used the, the printing. This gives, a, and you, have, you don't have any art notes either, by the way, I noticed. And you don't need them because it's all right there. Your images are so strong that an illustrator is just going to have plenty to work with. And by doing these things with the, the type, with the font, you know, it gives us the sense of this expansive illustration. I can see this as a spread. Together they traveled far and wide and you've got the horizon. You know, then they're in the mountains, they're at the sea, they're, they're everywhere and in many different places around the world and through deep blue skies. And then we've got the safaris. So from this section, I'm guessing that Abuela Tita traveled a lot. She didn't just go to another town to become an artist. She actually went around the world. And so, yes, I'm going to reiterate that I would like to see a little bit of that journey up here. I think we need it. I need it. It doesn't have to be huge, but I need to see something happening. So she went away to become an artist, and then she came back, and everything was still gloomy. Where does Vida come in? That's my only issue here. Where does Vida come in? Where, where did she come from? <laughs> so, you know, without weighing it down too much. Now, because the title is Arte es Vida, I'm going to assume that now Vida is going to take over and you know, take her uh, abuela's stories and somehow turn them into life in the present because arte es vida. And she becomes the, let's say, the savior, the artistic savior of this very gray, one shape, one shade of gray town. Um, I don't know that. I just have to guess because uh, this is all I've got to work with. And I would love to read the rest of this, honestly. <laughs> I think it's really lovely. Um... And so, because it is going to become Vida's story, I again, that's just another reason where, why I would love to have a little more of Abuela's story and where Vida fits in in the beginning. Where did she come from uh, in the beginning? But besides that, I think this is beautiful. I think the language is beautiful. It's really poetic. Very strong images throughout, one after the other. I can see every line. And your pacing is nice, too. There's a definite progression going on here. You know, we've got the, the passage of time is so clear in this, in this part here. And then uh, through the, their travels. Your use of Spanish in this is subtle and lovely. And you're really just using a couple of key words, pueblo, abuelita, and artista. Maybe you could find a couple of more words here and there, although your, the scope of this isn't like Anna's piece where uh, she's really putting a lot more Spanish in there and making it really a part of the story. Yours is simply is because it is an abuela. It is a pueblo. Um, it's not about teaching any sort of Spanish words here. It's just what they are. It's, she is an artista. But having said that, I might look to see if there's any place else you could use a word or two in Spanish later on in the manuscript. Maybe you do. I don't know. 
Um, but as it is right now, it's very balanced, very subtle and lovely. And the language itself is lovely. So well done, Cynthia. And thank you so much for sending this in. For this week's writing prompt, I'm taking inspiration from Cynthia's piece that I just finished critiquing. And that is to write the opening of a picture book, MG or YA, in which something is not quite right in the town and leave us with a little bit of intrigue like Cynthia did and see where it takes you. All right, so that's it for Peek and Critique for this week. Again, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and we will see you here again next time. Happy writing.